Have Native Americans always been in America? It's obvious that they've been here for a long time, much longer than Europeans have been here. But did the ancestors to Native Americans ever live somewhere else? It's a much more contentious question than many people realize, and one with answers that you've probably never guessed. My name is Nathaniel Jensen. I'm the research biologist with Answers in Genesis, and this is the Lost History of North America. If you're a member of a Native American nation, you might be wondering why a Caucasian like me would be discussing such a personal topic, one near and dear to Native Americans. I've gotten a better sense of this being at the Lakota Treaty Council just last week, and I've got a better sense for how precious this is to Native American identity. If you've been with me before, you know that I place a great emphasis on what Native Americans themselves say about their own history, and today is no exception. So I hope you'll stick with me to the end. In addition to this larger question of have Native Americans always been here, I'm going to focus on a more specific question. Where do the Navajos and the Apaches come from? Is this even the right question to ask? Have they always been in the southwest of what is now the United States? For the majority of the remainder of our time, I want to use a combination of linguistics, genetics, and indigenous history to try to solve this specific question. And along the way, we'll discover many surprises about the larger question of have Native Americans always been in America? With regards to the Navajos and the Apaches, the academic linguistic community has classified their languages as part of a larger language family. So in this map, the Navajos and Apaches were found around the time of contact down here, again, in what's now Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, other places. But the linguistic community ties them to other peoples and languages at the time of European contact, languages and peoples that existed on the West Coast and very heavily up in Northwest Canada and in Alaska. So given these linguistic connections, is it valid to hypothesize that the peoples of the American Southwest were once residents of the bitterly cold Arctic North? The academic community would say yes. In fact, they would give even more detail based on the specifics of the linguistic relationships among these people groups. I'm going to change the colors of this map to make this point. I'm following the classification given by Lyle Campbell. I've got a book here in my office, American Indian Languages. He's one of the leading scholars on American Indian linguistics. This is similar to what the Wycliffe Bible translators have said, their academic arm, which publishes the Ethnologue. They give a similar classification. And Campbell's book shows three major divisions within this Athabascan language family. The group in the north, the group on the west coast, and then the group in the southwest of the United States. This classification would imply that these all originated, that these major subgroups separated at the same time. And given the lack of hierarchy, it's not entirely clear where the point of origin would be for these separate groups. I haven't, however, told you the whole story. This map shows the Athabascan language family, but modern classification would actually call this the Ayak Athabascan language family, with the deepest division being between the Athabascan languages and the Ayak languages, which are today in the far north. So I'd have to, to be consistent with what's the current view, renumber this scheme, the deepest division again being between Ayak and Athabascan, and then the major divisions between blue, green, and yellow, 2A, 2B, 2C, being a second step. So given that the AAC is in the far north, and they would have split off first, I think it's reasonable to hypothesize linguistically that the AAC Athabascan language family members originated up here, the first separation happened up here, and then later these other groups separated from them. But what do the Athabascans say about their origins? In 2012, a book was published called From the Land of Everwinter, to the American Southwest, Athabascan Migrations, Mobility, and Ethnogenesis, and I'll have this full reference here in a subsequent slide. This book contained a chapter focused almost exclusively on the indigenous history of the Mescalero Apaches. So do they say they came from the north and headed south? And do they say they have any connection to regions beyond? Because that's the larger question. Do Athabascans have any links beyond the American continent to someplace else? The, the 
mainstream scientific community would say, yes, they do have connections to Asia. Do the Apaches themselves say so? So now I'm going to quote from this book chapter. Again, you have the full reference with page numbers. You can look this all up yourself to verify what I'm saying. The authors describe who they spoke to. They said the information presented here in that chapter comes largely from ethnographic interviews conducted by the authors with the late Bernard II, a leading singer or holy man of the Mescalero Apache. We had the privilege of being adopted by his family and working with him for a total of 20 years, so units of 6 and 14 years respectively, up until his passing in 1998. During the time we worked with Bernard, many Mescalero considered him to be the ranking holy man. He was often expected to lead the singers in the Holy Lodge during the Mescalero Apache girls' puberty ceremony. Even Wendell Chino, former president of the Mescalero tribe, indicated that it was necessary to speak to Bernard about matters of history. Bernard had long been aware of the standard anthropological view that the ancestors of Native Americans were ultimately derived from Asian populations who had migrated to the New World via the Bering Land Bridge. And the mainstream community says 15,000 years ago, if you've been with me, you know I have also talked about connections to Asia, but on a different time scale. Nevertheless, while he respected our views about Native American origins as the product of serious professional study, he remained skeptical. After all, he knew that his own people had originated here, on this continent, the Americas, on the shores of a lake you can't see over in a land of everwinter. And I highlight this because it's emblematic of other Native American views that, no, we originated here. There's no connections and and the Lakotas, as another example, have a very strong opposition to the Bering Land Bridge hypothesis. We'll come back to this, but now you can see, especially if you're not Native American, perhaps you're not aware of this, but there is a strong tension between what Native Americans say about their origins and what the mainstream community has been pushing about the connections between the Americas and Native Americans and Asia. Mescalero ritual dance, specifically the girls' puberty ceremony, has been described as a four-part few. So I'm, I'm going to give you more details now of what Bernard described as their history. There is this larger looming question of connections to Asia, but the more immediate question is, do the southwestern tribes have any connections to the northern part of North America? Over the four nights of this ceremony, the girls in the Holy Lodge dance to a long, intricate series of sacred songs. It is these sacred songs that contain and maintain the knowledge of the deep antiquity of tribal history. Mescalero Apache have names for places far to the north, dating back to the distant past, before their arrival in the southwest. These landmarks are still known, even though the people have not occupied or used those regions for many generations. So the fact that they're referring in their own history back to the north is consistent with the linguistics. When, the, when discussing these places, Bernard, the elder, often emphasized the northern roots, high degree of mobility, and the plains affiliation of the Mescalero, in contrast to many other peoples, for example, the Pueblos of the southwest. Again, consistent with what we've just discussed with linguistics. The Mescalero still use teepees, when the Holy Lodge constructed during the girls' puberty ceremony is a ceremonial teepee. They still know how to make snowshoes for use in deep snow, a skill they learned in the northern plains for which they have little need, obviously, in the southwest. The best Apache hunting bows are backed with horn and sinew. This technology is not common among Native Americans of the United States, but the Apache brought it with them from the subarctic. Before confinement on the reservation, and quoting Bernard, when we were still a free people, the Mescalero used scaffold burials like other plains groups. Now, this, you know, the, the, the initials here, BS, that's Bernard II, and the dates are, I think, the date of the interview. Mescaleros never made pottery, and they were the last of the Apache groups to migrate south. Interesting. They were preceded in the southwest by three earlier groups. And I'm going to pause here for a minute, and it, it, there's a bit of an ambiguity in my mind. I had been thinking that they're talking about three different Apache groups migrating south, I suppose it's possible he's talking about, no, there are three native Southwest groups. Either way, there's others who preceded the Mescaleros. So this quote here, they preceded by in, in the Southwest by three earlier groups, hunting peoples, those who made pottery, and the small ancient people. For the time being, I'm just going to go with, there were three Apache groups, perhaps, of Athabascan groups that preceded the Mescaleros in the migration South, whether it's three or one. The point is there were earlier migrants 
The Mescalero were made in a land of Everwinter, near a lake you could not see across, Great Slave Lake or, or Slavi Lake, or Lake Athabasca, according to different variations of the story. It so happened that while the Mescalero were in these northern regions, troubles developed between them and other peoples. Some of them relatives. There was a great catastrophe, and while and, and the Mescalero were being devastated, they were fighting near the shore of Lake Athabasca. Following this battle, the Apache were surrounded by goodness and beauty. They became a people and started drifting south. The beginning of the southward migration was also the time of their separation from the Slavey, is how you pronounce it, Indians, estimated about 600 years ago. Now, the interview there you see is 1985. So you subtract 600 years from 1985 to get a date then or a year, approximate year for when they started migrating from the north southward. So hopefully what you're seeing again is the Mescalero own indigenous history describes links to the north, a migration southward, so much so that we can even put a date on when this happened. And, and don't forget, there, there are other peoples from the north preceding them, perhaps three. And so if the Mescalero are the last, and their year is 1385, the earlier group or groups must have been before 1385. So perhaps the 1300s, perhaps the 1200s. I'm speculating, but we know it's pre-1385, a point we'll come back to in a minute. The ancestors of the Mescaleros moved southwest along the Athabasca River drainage, bringing them into contact with the Sarsi people. Over the years, the Apache became closely related to the Sarsi, especially in the area west of present-day Edmonton. One of Bernard's grandmothers was Sarsi, and even after the Apache moved farther south, they exchanged children with the Sarsi, and I'll put here on the map where they were in a minute, so that, they, so that both groups would always remember the closeness of their relationship. Now, the Sarsi go by different names on this map. It doesn't give them as Sarsi, but Right there is where they were, I think, at time of contact. So they're, they're separating and then going south. And, and notice some of the other places that are mentioned. As the people continued to move south and east along the Rocky Mountain front ranges, it was not unusual for them to travel to the Missouri River. And, and each of these places I'll point out on the map in a minute. To hunt buffalo and to trade with other tribes and the French. Sometimes they traveled across the northern Great Plains as far as the Great Lakes. The other peoples with whom the Apache had contact at this time included the Mandan, Sioux, Arapaho, and Cheyenne. Bernard noted that the Apache were in the Black Hills long before the Crow and Cheyenne. The Crow, Pawnee, Mandan, and Hidatsa were all river people until they got the horse. So the Missouri River begins up this way, comes down, passes through the center of the Dakotas, goes this way, eventually ends up in the state of Missouri, reaching the Mississippi. So when he says they're by the Missouri, it could be out this way. The Great Lakes, of course, are over here. So even though I've got the arrow pointing this way, it appears there's been a lot of movements eastward and back on the way southward. And the Black Hills, of course, are in the western part of South Dakota. Now, I've mentioned this earlier, but I'm going to emphasize it again. If you've been with us before in this series, and I'll show you how you can find other episodes in this series in a minute, you know that one of the aspects of indigenous history that excites me the most is when the different indigenous histories talk to one another and cross-correlate one another. And one of the main indigenous histories we've looked at in previous episodes is the indigenous history known as the Red Record or Wallum Olam, the current position of the Delaware due to a, a Westerner writing a PhD thesis in 95, is that this is a fraudulent, I've shown in previous episodes, this actually anticipated genetic discoveries a century or two in the future all that tells me it's not fraudulent, it's real history. And combining this with other members of the Algonquin or Algic language family, the indigenous histories of Blackfeet and Cheyenne and Potawatomi, we've been able to reconstruct this gloriously complex migration for the Algonquin peoples with dates and places and names. And a lot of this, again, you can find in previous episodes. If you go to Answers in Genesis YouTube channel, we'll provide all these links in the description go to the Playlists tab and look for the Lost History of North America series. You can find, it'll take you to a page like this and you can find a, a lot of the justification for what I'm showing in this map. Now I want to sim simplify this busy diagram to show you where I think this account crosstalks with Athabascan Apache history. So here's a simpler version of their migration. They do seem to describe a crossing of the Bering Strait and going down the western part of Canada, across the Great Plains, eventually re reaching the Mississippi, and ultimately landing on the eastern seaboard where they were at the time of European contact. 
one of the biggest events in this history that we can see an archaeological echo of was a great battle at the Mississippi with the Talegas, which I think, here's the quotes then from the Red Record, are the Natchez and their relatives, perhaps also Muscogians. They talk about there being a war going eastward to the rising sun. They separated the Mississippi. Now the battles, the lodge man, notice the dates here as well, 1250s and later. The lodge man was the sage and the Telega possessed the east, which again, I think are Natchez and relatives. The strong ally was the sage land to the east. He asked for eastward some travel. The Telega king massacred them. So they tried to go east, were stopped in their tracks, were obviously upset by this. And then, so this translation I have is by David McCutcheon. I think he does a good job. He attempts to translate the, the Delaware word here is Iroquois. I think he's taking a good guess based on the information he has. I think a better translation is likely one of the Sioux and Catawban language family members, perhaps the Winnebagos or Ho-Chunk and others, whoever they were, the arrival of these allies was instrumental in the success of the Algonquins and their ability to defeat the Cahokians, the Natchez, and proceed eastward. So Sharp One was the sage and the pathmaker, now we're the 1266. I should say, and I've mentioned this when I discussed this and derived this in other episodes, I give exact years, but these are estimates, so it's roughly around that time. They won many victories, driving away the Telegas, not ultimately, because then, while well, stirring was the sachem, extremely strong were the Telegas. Then they continued their victories, they captured the great towns, and finally, when the guy named Crusher was the sachem, southward flood out the Telegas. You can see the echoes of this archaeologically. So it took several sachems, several decades, before they finally were able to permanently defeat the Telegas. And you see the timing line up with a with a fall archaeologically of Cahokia, but the, the but the persistence of the Mississippian culture in the southeast, further to the south, south of Mississippi. Now, why go east in the first place and have these great battles, which were not initially met with success? What happened earlier in the 1200s? And I want to back us up. I introduced this section to you with this guy East looking and he it said he was melancholy about the war. What war? Let's back up seven stanzas from this point to the earlier 1200s so you can see what exactly happened. And this is, I think, where the link to the Mescaleros comes in. And that's what I think is, is thrilling. So just real fast now, the sachems who led up to this. White Chick was the sachem, 1206. Once more, bloodshed. Notice the pattern. Then Mighty Wolf, 1214. He could fight every foe. The strong stone he struck down. So more battles. 1221, wholehearted, fighting the snakes. 1229, strong is good, the sagem. Fighting the north walkers. 1236, poor one, fighting invaders. So when it says east looking was the sagem, melancholy about the war, they had several decades of war on the plains. No wonder they wanted to go eastward. They wanted to escape all that. And then ran into the buzzsaw of Cahokia, which with the help of allies, they were eventually able to defeat did you notice something, though, in what I just read in those sachems? I want to list for you again the enemies that they faced, strong stone, the snakes. If you read the red record, you'll notice stone is, is a term they use for enemies on a number of occasions. Snakes shows up frequently as a term for enemies. I don't know if it's just a generic term, but it's there a lot. Invaders is, is a generic term. Notice this one, though, how evocative. In 1229, they fight someone called the North Walkers. Why would they call them that? And who is that? Back to the larger map, these Algonquins and Delawares start in the north and pass through the Arctic regions, through Canada, before eventually arising on the Great Plains. They had major battles up here. They surely ran into other peoples. They talk about there being other peoples who preceded them in the Americas. If you look at the map of who may have been up here, or if you, I should say if you look at the map of contact, that's the region dominated by the Athabascans. So my guess is the Algonquins ran into Athabascans during their initial migration into North America. Then in 1229, roughly, they do battle with someone called the North walkers. Could these be Athabascans migrating south? Why call them the North Walkers? Perhaps because they're coming from the north. 
and because the Algonquins may have already run into them earlier in their history. Why call them the North Walkers? The horse was in North America in ancient times when extinct, apparently. It was reintroduced with the arrival of Europeans. As best as we can tell, I think, the horse wasn't there. So if you want to get around, you get around by walking. Walking where? Perhaps walking south. Remember the Mescaleros say they broke away and started heading south late 1300s, but there were one or more peoples who preceded them who may, so if we just estimate, speculate, could have been the 1300s, perhaps even the 1200s. So I wonder, given the eerie and intriguing overlap in the dates, if this indigenous history is indeed talking about doing battle with these guys migrating south. If these accounts are indeed cross-talking and cross-validating one another. Okay, so a, a compelling picture is emerging for the Mescalera Apache history, given what they say, given what other people say, given what linguistics describes. But we still haven't dealt with that sticky question of where the Athabascans were earlier. Were they always in the north, or were they once on a different continent? Remember that Bernard said his own people had originated here, on this continent, on the shores of Lake You Can't See over in the land of Everwinter. What I want to do now, and again, and again, this is if if you're not of native descent, this is a deeply held aspect of indigenous history, something I think my impression is goes right along with native identity. This is who we are. We started here, and no, we have no links elsewhere. So what do you do? I want to bring in modern genetics, which may surprise you if you know anything about Navajos. This is a bit of an obscure fact, but if you've looked into the Navajo Reservation website or their current practices or the history of genetic testing among the Native American community, there's there's a backstory about abuses. Right now, the Navajo Nation has a moratorium on genetic testing. The Navajos are one of the most populous Native American nations right now in the United States. Very Hundreds of thousands of members, either the same or very close to the number of Cherokees who are registered. So how can we talk about Athabascan genetics if one of the biggest Athabascan nations today forbids genetic testing. Have I been doing secret genetics behind their back? No. What I want to show you is there's publicly available data that anyone can access that already gives us some clues as to what the native, or I should say, what the, what the Athabascan genetic lineage is. If you've been with us before, you know that one of the main genetic tools I've been using to investigate Native American history is the male inherited DNA, the Y chromosome. It's passed on imperfectly from generation to generation. This acts like a biological clock. I derived all this in previous episodes. I'm not going to rederive it here. Long story short, if you compare the Y chromosomes of men around the globe, count the number of differences, plug them into a program, and say, give me a visual depiction of what these mathematical differences look like, what emerges is something that looks like a family tree. That's what this is. A family tree based on the Y chromosome DNA, the male inherited DNA differences of 600 men from around the globe. We've got tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Y chromosome tests and results. This is just a representative example. The colors and letters and numbers are just technical shorthand in the mainstream community for figuring out at a glance where you are on the tree, so don't let that intimidate you or confuse you. For our purposes, the two major branches found among Native Americans today, once you remove the European and, and African ones, due to late colonialism and the ugly history of the transatlantic slave trade, the two remaining branches are Q and C. Again, the letters are semi-arbitrary. That's just the branches Native Americans happen to be found in. I'm claiming I can identify a good candidate for the Athabascans, even though there's currently a moratorium on genetic testing among the Navajos, and the reason I can do so is simply because there's publicly available data. Again, if you've been with us before in the series, you know that I, I did something similar for the Algic or Algonquin peoples. Family Tree DNA is one of the biggest databases out there. They're a commercial genetic testing company, but they have 
in their database over 214,000 tested users, 214,000 Y chromosome tested men. And for the Algonquins, this is how we identified. I'm going to go through this quickly. It, it's a bit technical, but just know that this is the type of approach we're taking. So again, we've got these two main branches. Haplogroup is just a fancy technical term for branch. So branch C, branch Q, the main Native American branches. We have that in this family tree DNA database. Now they don't tell you the Native American nation. They don't say this is Navajo, this is Cree, this is Cherokee. They just say this is Native and this is a native from Canada or from the United States. They would say, okay, here's a branch and this is a First Nation Canada, or this is Native American United States, and that's it. There's hundreds of Native American nations, First Nations, and all they give you is Canada, the United States, or Mexico, current national entities. That's what they give, and they're giving you the DNA from living people. I tend to ignore all the stuff from fossils just for reasons I don't have time to get into. So we have the DNA from living people, we also have, this is the second publicly available data set, census data. So I'm using the data from the United States from 2010, in which they talk about Native Americans and how they report themselves. I focus, for reasons I don't have time to get into, on the native, or, or the, the reporting of natives who say, I'm native, only native, and only one tribe, just because I think that's a better test case for looking at this genetic data. They're more likely to have a Native American branch. And then I use the 2016 Canadian census data where they have First Nation statistics. All that to say, in the United States, there's a diversity of Native Americans still alive today, distributed among a variety of language families. So one of the top ones here, Aak Athabascan, but also Iroquoian, which Cherokee is part of that. Then the Algic, which was the focus in previous episodes. Uh, and in Canada, the reason we were able to identify the Algic language family branch is because in Canada, 80% of First Nation members belong to the Algic language family. Uh, and if we just simplify this, these statistics, Canada is dominated by Algic. The reverse is true in the United States. Algic is a small minority dominated by other groups. And then when you compare these statistics to the frequency of these, these genetic branches in the databases, there's this strong overlap. Again, I went through this quickly, didn't derive it in great detail, but the point is comparing DNA results from living men to census numbers, we we're able to already identify the Algic or Algonquin language family branch. Can we do the same for the Athabascan? Yes, there's Athabascans in Canada, but if we back up here, you'll notice that they're just a small fraction of the total. Aak Athabascan Canada is only about 2%. And there aren't many Canadian First Nation branches in the Family Tree DNA database. So not enough to have a, any hopes of having a statistical fighting chance of, of finding it. So I'm, I'm going to ignore the Canadian data for the moment. I'm not going to look at haplogroup C, branch C, because we've already identified that, that as Algonquin. That was, again, all background. Even if you didn't follow all that, what we want to do now is compare the frequency of sub-branches of branch Q, because branch C, we've already identified as Algonquin. Are there any sub-branches of Q that exist at a frequency that might match the frequency by census of living AAC Athabascan members today? So they're about a fourth, almost 25% of the total Native Americans alive, at least in 2010. So what do we see in this database? There is a branch Again, these are just technical terms. What is it? You don't need to memorize all this. Q-Y4300 just so happens to be at a frequency among the U.S. members in this study, among Native American branches, of about 24%. Interesting. That's not enough by my standards to call that Athabascan because the Iroquoian are 22%, and, and this percentage is not from an academic study, it's just from user-reported data. So finding this branch that's at this frequency, and I don't think there's really any other branch that reaches this high of a frequency in this in this family tree DNA data set for, for Native American purposes. This frequency to me says this is a good candidate, yes, for Aak Athabascan, but it could also be an Iroquoian branch. Maybe this is Cherokee. These other family language family members don't have a high enough percentage to make me think it, this could be one of theirs. Theoretically possible, but unlikely. So I'd say the first line of evidence that to me suggests this could be a candidate for 
Athabaskan is its frequency. It's close to Aoc Athabaskan. It's also close to Iroquoian, so we have to find additional evidence to distinguish between these two. This is a publicly available database. You can look this up yourself. You'll find that this Q-43Y4300 also has branches, subbranches that connect to Mexico. Why is that important? At contact, the Athabascans were found at what's now the U.S.-Mexico border. But the Iroquoians, just to advance the labels here, were in the east, not by Mexico. So the fact that this branch is close in frequency to the frequency of Ath living Athabascans and has connections to Mexico, to me, tells me this is a much better candidate for Athabascan than for Iroquoian. And the third line of evidence that makes this a strong candidate, in my mind, for the Athabascan lineage, is that one of the Navajo code talkers who aided the United States in World War II in defeating the Japanese submitted one of his, a sample of his DNA for testing shortly before he passed. And he also belongs to this branch. So these three lines of evidence together, I think, suggest this is the Athabascan genetic lineage. Why does that matter? For our larger question of where do the Athabascans come from, because this subbranch Y4300 is a subbranch of Q, branch Q, branch Q has a clearly defined history, one that links it to Asia. This map shows you circles representing the relative frequency frequency of this particular branch. This is from academic studies. So these big circles represent 90% or 100% of the total. It's, it's high abundance among Native Americans when you remove the European and African branches. In the Old World, there's larger circles in this Siberian Central Asian area, and that's, to, to make another long story short, is the origin of this branch, apparently. This is the same time when other Central Asians were migrating into Europe, the Huns were invading the Roman Empire around this time. The Shanbai and the other side of the old world in China were taking up residence after the fall of the Han Dynasty in China. So there's Huns into Europe, Shanbai into China, and then there's apparently a third group of Central Asians migrating into the Americas shortly before the, I guess you could say almost the Roman era equivalent in the Americas, the Mayan Empire was, was falling a very intriguing cause-effect relationship. But this genetic data would suggest that the Athabascans, given these multiple steps of, of linkage, linking the Athabascans to this lineage, linking this lineage to the history of Branch Q, this would suggest that perhaps in the 300s to 600s, yes, they were in Northwest North America, but prior to that time, just to, to kind of average things out, uh, before the 400s, 300s, these genetic data would suggest the Athabascans were not in the Americas, but in Asia. Now, I've been quoting to you from Bernard's, Bernard Second's Mescalero Indigenous History, the Mescalero Patch. You're not the only indigenous Athabascan history out there. There's another group called the Chippewans. If you're from the United States, this is not Chippewa, who have reservations in Minnesota or Ojibwe. This is a different group, spelled very similar, Chippewan or Chippewayan. They're in Canada, right there, in case it's not readable on your screen. This is from a quote in 1851, so not influenced by the modern academic view. Schoolcraft is the author, and he's talking about someone else. In the voyages of Sir Alexander Mackenzie among the Arctic tribes, he relates that of the Chippewayans, that they have a tradition that they originally came from another country inhabited by very wicked people, and had traversed a great lake, which was narrow and shallow and full of islands, where they had suffered great misery, it being always winter with ice and deep snow. Their progress, the great Athapasca or Athabascan family, is easterly, and according to their own tradition, they came from Siberia. And the point of bringing this up is not to say, therefore, Bernard II is wrong. The point is to raise the question, what do you do? And Bernard II, again, is representative, I think, of not just the Mescaleros, but of other Native American peoples who say we originated here. How do you reconcile all this? Well, I think really the question is, what did Bernard do to reconcile this? I only gave you part of the 
context for his quote. Now I'll give you the full context. So I had said earlier, he knew his own people had originated here. He was aware of the mainstream view, but he remained skeptical. So let me back up and give you the full context for this quote. I find it rather moving, knowing how personal and deeply meaningful the connection to America is for so many Native American tribes. The Mescalero Apache story of origins and migration related here in this book chapter from this 2012 book is not the story of an old man with failing memory. So you, you can't dismiss Bernard's account by saying, ah, he didn't know what he was talking about. Bernard passed away at the age of 46. So when he recited his oral histories, he was vital and in the prime of life. Bernard was a polymath and spoke three dialects of Apache, as well as Navajo, Spanish, English, German, and Japanese. This is a brilliant man. You can't just say, ah, genetics contradicts him, we're going to dismiss him. What do you do with this very intelligent man who's got a very clear connection to America? One summer afternoon, he, Bernard, had received a group of visitors, including a man from Japan. Bernard relished the opportunity to practice the language because he spoke Japanese, smart guy, and learned about Japanese culture. He speaks more languages than I do. I speak German and learning Spanish, English, <laughs> and this guy's brilliant. So Bernard talked to this Japanese man. Bernard spent a couple of hours in deep conversation with the Japanese man. Clearly, there were some similarities in physical appearance between the Japanese man and at least some Apache people. That's what Westerners notice. Ah, there's physical similarities, but that's not what caught Bernard's attention. Bernard was more impressed by some specific similarities between their two cultures. The visitor, the Japanese visitor, traced his family roots to the samurai tradition. And even though the samurai influence in Japanese society declined in the late 19th century and officially ended after World War II, the family maintained knowledge of its ancestral traditions. Bernard and the Japanese visitor spoke at length about what it means or what it meant to be a warrior in the traditional sense. To Bernard's surprise, there were a number of detailed similarities between the samurai code of Bushido and the Mescalero Apache way of the warrior. These or The similarities included not only the sorts of behaviors expected of warriors in each society, such as the importance of duty, honor, and self-sacrifice, but also the underlying spiritual insights on which the codes are based. Bernard, and the, now is the quote that I gave to you earlier, but in context. Bernard had long been aware of the standard anthropological view that the ancestors of Native Americans were ultimately derived from Asian populations who had migrated to the New World via the Bering Land Bridge. And these authors are speaking in the mainstream context of a single migration 15,000 years ago. I, of course, have been giving you a different view over the series of multiple migrations from Asia in a much shorter time frame. Nevertheless, while Bernard respected our views about Native American origins as the product of serious professional study, he remained skeptical. After all, he knew that his own people had originated here, on this continent, North America, on the shores of a lake you can't see over in the land of Everwinter, and as we've seen in northern North America, Canada, Alaska area. Until meeting the Japanese visitor, he had no firsthand exposure to any culture that might lend credence to the notion of an ancient connection between his people and an Asian population. But after that meeting, the possibility of a connection to another continent became an observable reality. Moreover, it became a matter of personal intellectual interest for Bernard to reconcile the existence of such a connection with his knowledge of the origin of his people. He accomplished the reconciliation in a very simple yet elegant way by drawing a distinction between biological heredity and cultural identity. That is, and they're quoting him now, we, the Mescalero Apache, became a people near Lake Athabasca, but we have earlier biological connections to Asian populations. Have Native Americans always been in America? This is a deeply personal question of identity for many Native American peoples. And I found Bernard Second's own history his account of his people's origins and his struggle with what to do with a variety of lines of evidence. Moving, inspiring, and I hope if you're Native American, this will be helpful or something to consider. So I'm suggesting that the Athabascans did indeed come here from Asia. I've given you a date that's fairly late in history, in the first millennium AD, 
If you know anything about North American archaeology, there is a long history of peoples here before that. Who were they? What's their history? And to find out the answer, I have a Native American history project in which if you're a member of a Native American nation, I need your help in three areas. One is finding more indigenous histories. What I've just shown you, and hopefully if you've been with us, you've seen this over and over again. So many indigenous histories are dismissed by mainstream science as mythological or unreliable or not written down so we can't trust them. And I've seen that attitude destroyed. Not that they've rejected that view, but I've seen evidence contradict that time and time again. So my attitude is these histories are true. And one of the most critical clues to understanding the history of the Americas. And you might say, why would I care as a Caucasian about Native American history? And to answer that briefly, I grew up knowing next to nothing about Native American history and couldn't have told you the conditions of peoples on reservations. I was at the La Lakota Treaty Council meeting and the wristband they gave us is we're still here. And I think that's due to the fact that so many Caucasians like myself just aren't even aware who has survived European incursion. And so my goal is to recover that history and to communicate to other Caucasians so that they learn to respect the history that came before, the heroes, the names, the people, the events, the empires, in the same way that they respect European history. If you don't know it, you, how can you have respect for it? I want them to know it. They live here. They should know what happened prior and respect those who came prior. And then secondly, be aware of those who remain. Not that there should be a whole bunch of so-called white saviors who come in and, and rescue the Indians type thing. Not that. My goals are modest, that the living Caucasians would learn who came before, they'd recognize who are here now, and respect and care for all that. Because if you don't know, how can you care? And indigenous histories are a critical clue to un uncovering all this. I've, I'm, I'm looking all across North America. This project will also eventually be in Latin America, and I'll be in Latin America this coming year. But with the Iroquoians, with many tribes on the west coast of the United States and Canada, I haven't been able to find as many indigenous histories to give the clues as I'd like. So if, if you have clues along that respect, love to hear it. If you're a member of any nation in North America, I've been trying to synthesize all these indigenous histories. I would be grateful for your help in that respect. Secondly, we are looking to genetics. There's a way I think we can do this semi-privately, where I've talked to the family treaty in ACO, where he said he can ship test kits to me so long as I can assure him I'm taking care of the ethical side of things. And I can distribute the kits to the participants. I'm the only one then who has, or Answers in Genesis is the only entity that has the personal information when we send the test kits, which are just, I think, cheek swabs, not blood samples. Cheek swabs back to the company. All they get is tubes with numbers, not tubes with names and addresses. They run the samples. They give the data back to me. Then I go back to the participants. Here's what your data means for the wider question. I'd like to be able to publish that, not with the personal information, but here's the family tree. Here's the branches. This branch is this nation. This branch is this nation. Here's a branch we just discovered. I anticipate that happening at some point that no one else has discovered. That'll give some clues to who was here earlier. We're looking for males who can say, yeah, my dad, his dad, his dad, going all the way back, goes back to Native American males because I've had, uh, the, the Y chromosome is weird. You could, I, I've had men come and say, look, I'm Caucasian like you are, but we've done my family history and I go back to a Native American chieftain or, or male Native American nation member and I've done a Y chromosome test and, and I'm in a native branch, even though my physical appearance would suggest otherwise. And I've had the reverse. A guy who's living on one of the reservations looks Native American but says, hey, I know my family history. I know I go back to a Caucasian on the father's side and so I'm going to have a European origin Y chromosome. So that's why I'm saying we're looking for males with strictly native paternal ancestry to better our chances of finding the Native American Y chromosome lineages. I have contacts now in about 30 to 35 different nations. Like I said, I've just been at the Lakota Treaty Council speaking to them about what can they do. Uh, recommendations I had for if they wanted to do genetic testing, how can they go about doing this? I've got about 25 Y chromosome candidates so far from different nations who've come to me saying, yeah, I want to participate. I've got this paternal link third group though or third way you can be of help if you're a native american nation member is just looking for advocates folks who can say when you get to that point and 
if we get to about 100 Native American volunteers, which is my goal, given budget and, and other considerations, I will need to get the permissions of each participating tribal nation. And just pause for a minute and say this, this may be uh, the last for a while in this series of the Lost History of North America, episode five. We may do episode six, uh, where I, I give some sort of a, here's a how-to. If, if you're a Native American nation, think about genetic testing, sort of tell you what I told the Lakotas about seven points to consider how to avoid tests that the government may use against you, uh, show how genetics is confirming indigenous histories, ways to potentially do this privately, and so on. Uh, but I'm at the stage now, I need to write this into a book. So if, if you like the content, you say, I want some more, hopefully I'll have a book within the next 12 to 16 months that goes into much more detail. So stay tuned. And then when that book comes out, we'll probably have some more videos. But along the way, then, as we're doing this project, this, we're going to be doing the project along the way, even as I'm writing, I'm going to need advocates who say, we want to know our history. Because my impression is me just going in as a Caucasian, unlikely that anyone would want to approve of this. But if there's a whole group of Native Americans saying, no, we, we want to know more details about this, you can be an advocate. So to get in touch with me then, if you go to our homepage, ancestorsgenesis.org, and you type in slash go slash traced, traced is the name of a book that I published last year, I'll tell you about in a minute. It should take you to a page that looks like that. You can click on this button or just scroll down on that page to enter your name and email. This goes directly to my email inbox. Uh, this is how I've gotten in touch with so many. It's actually how I got in touch with the Lakota Treaty Council, they messaged me, and so we started dialoguing and did Zoom meetings, and then I traveled out there. Again, you can find more in this series if you go to our, our Answers in Genesis YouTube page, the playlists, and find this tab. We'll give the links in the description. It'll take you to a page that looks like this. You can also get in touch with me on social media. I've got a variety of accounts because I don't know which ones I'll get kicked off of. I um, have some more of the backstory to this history and, and global genetic history in this book that came out in March of 2022, Traced Human DNA's Big Surprise. We did about a 16, 17 part series of videos that, that describe a lot of the conclusions in this book. One of the early Native American summaries, you can find that series episode three. And then there's, if you have Googled this, you might have found this series as well. New History of the Human Race we did during lockdown in 2020 that gave the initial results that led to the book Traced. 2017, I published a book called Replacing Darwin because what I'm doing is not mainstream, which may actually be a good thing for many Native American communities because it, it frees us to find the links between indigenous history and genetics. But this is the book where I justify basically why it's not mainstream, why I disagree with evolution, why I think we don't come from apes, but that humans are created and, and kinds of creatures are created. The, the Cliff Notes version of this, this, this gets into some detail. It's written to be understandable, but it does get into the weeds genetically. This is sort of the Cliff Notes version, and you can find a one-hour summary of that in, in DVD form or on our streaming service, Answers.tv, with thousands of videos on there. Answers in Genesis is also the ministry with, or a Christian organization with the Creation Museum, Ark County here in Northern Kentucky. You can come visit us. Uh, and, and I especially encourage you to take a look at how we've depicted the ethnicities of Noah's family. Where do all the different nations come from, especially Native Americans? This topic, this arc, deals directly with that. Have Native Americans always been here? I hope this episode has been helpful to you. Again, this, this may be a pause for a while. We may do one more, which I'd be grateful for your help in sharing it. But there's, there's more content coming. It just may be in book form. So stay tuned. Thank you for being with us. This is Nathaniel Jensen with The Lost History of North America.